uh, again, uh, you know, this, uh, I guess, subcommittee of the Vermont State Senate looking at transitions related to COVID-19. We uh, today are gonna spend our time looking at the lists that have been submitted by the committee chairs uh, on this issue and what they see as um, particular issues um, with transitioning back to some level of equilibrium in the state. Some of you may have heard uh, I don't, uh, in the press that there's, uh, we have another outbreak down here in Southern Vermont at the Bennington School for Girls. Uh, apparently there is an outbreak there. So I think it's reemphasizing how um, tricky this transition um, is and, and can be. So what we thought we'd do today is look at all the lists. Uh, Senator Westman uh, arranged to have Ledge Council on. Um, and so what we're gonna start to do is break down into the various categories for each of the chairs of this, uh, subcommittee chairs um, sort of put an issue with a committee. So for example, when we go through judiciary, um, we'll see those parts that should go to governance, parts that might go to education, might go to economic development, might go to healthcare. And we're planning on doing that with all the committees. So I think what we'll do is just go through things quickly, as quickly as possible, as quickly as people feel comfortable. And uh, when there's a disagreement or a concern, um, when it's not evident, then we might have to have some uh, committee discussion. How does that sound to you, Senator Westman? That um, sounds great. I just say on the backside of that, um, I asked Luke to be on the call because what, uh, you know, um, I think we're envisioning is on an Excel uh, cell spreadsheet, we have the four broad categories. We have um, here's the issues that go in that. And then we're going to have to touch base with the standing committees to make sure that the issues that get on the sheet from, um, from each of the committees, that somebody's dealing with those issues. If a, if a standing committee's taking the issue up, we aren't going to, um, we aren't going to do their work. Um, but if we see holes, that's where we're going to try to work in, um, in to do that. And, and so um, that information about who's working on what will be the next thing that you'll want to do, figure out with the chairs of the committee and with interest groups that, that feed stuff to you. Um, what needs to be on there um, to, to move in there, trying to create an overall umbrella of a game plan. Great. Okay, so let's pull up those lists. I'm gonna leave to go get, I just had to go print the list. I'm not near, I'm not near it. Okay. Are you gonna start with Sears? Yeah, I'm just, uh, list of feedback from chairs, here we go. So, yeah, so um, to me, money needed in, uh, to restart courts um, sounds like a, something related to governance. Um, I'll just keep going and people can shout out disagreements. Uh, we can each take one of these if you'd like. Concerned about the hiring freeze in state government will impact how courts open and operate. I uh, think that's something that we want to let economic development know about. Uh, possible surge in corrections. We need to invest in community intervention programs. Uh, I think that's also would fall in governance. I also seem to think that we want to make sure that Ginny's committee healthcare is, is aware of that. Um, I would say that also Woodside needing additional funding would overlap with both healthcare as well as governance. And then concern about lack of access to jobs for when people leave prison. It seems to me that that's, that's something we wanna let, put on Michael's radar, Senator Sorokin's radar. Uh, how do people feel about that? Uh, any, I'll let people just disagree um, when they're ready to disagree. Uh, Deborah. Yeah, the only one that I would just question a little bit was uh, the second one, concerned about hiring freeze and stuff. Yeah. 
and how impact the courts. Isn't that more governance than? What did I say? You said economic development. Yeah, that sounds right. It sounds more governance. The, than the only government. thing with um, that's definitely related to the courts because the courts have a big ramp up uh, plan laid out that we've heard about. And the problem is it can't happen without comparable forces on the other side. In other words, the hiring freeze, there's a lot of shortages in the state's attorney's office, not enough people to do the cases. Yeah. Under general's um, area, they're very, very short of people. And in the Northeast Kingdom, there aren't even enough lawyers to get put some contracts out there. So the hiring yeah, freeze is definitely right. having an impact on whether they can prosecute cases. So that's definitely related to the courts. Yeah. Where, no, I think, I think that yeah, is development uh, where else did you think deb no i thought yeah governance i i, I agree with you me too I, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay health and welfare from senator lyons um shall i just continue richie do you want to take one yeah go ahead okay so she felt as though within economic development what will business what businesses will likely need our assistance and what resources do we need to provide them all health care is a business whether hospitals or home health each has different regulatory and financial structures. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, certainly belongs in, in health and welfare. Uh, Debbie, feel free to jump in. You're on that committee, right? And, I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're just also, what I mentioned about the, the Bennington Girls School having an outbreak over the weekend, we're noticing an outbreak. So I think also, you know, how do colleges and universities open up? How do all businesses open up? Um, all sort of belong in economic development and education. That leads me to, you know, what do our pre-K through 12 institutions need? Um, institutions of higher ed and guarantee them that strong enrollments and okay. So emphasize the programs that continue to draw students. Uh, I think just the question there is, um, and I think Ginny took this maybe a little bit more as an exam parts of her answers rather than uh, <laughs> listing things, which is fine. It kind of gets things going. Uh, it's, um, yeah, what are, what are those things that, I mean, education, uh, I think is, is also already starting to ask this question, right, Ruth, around what is it that folks are going to need when pre-K through 12 and even post-secondary open up? Do you want to say something? Yeah, no, you're right. We, we've we started to take testimony on that and have those conversations and it'd be good to explore that more with this yep. group. Yeah. So, so I would say in this, nationally in, in Vermont, they're talking about a 20% drop in the number of students um, across the country and in Vermont, people choosing to take a gap year, you know, all sorts of different reasons. Um, that 20% will be devastating to institutions here. Yeah. So is there something we can do in higher ed to, um, um, to avoid that? I think that clearly is an education issue and should, should be on the docket for education. Yeah. Um, it seems we might I, also want to put it on, on economic development just so that they too, uh, you know, all these institutions have jobs. I would suspect, you know, I know people haven't announced anything, but big layoffs across the board pre-K through post-secondary in, in um, so uh, letting them know about it as well. Yep, but. And then like you're saying, what can we do to prevent these kinds of things from happening? You know, you look at places like Middlebury and Bennington and maybe St. Michael's, you know, they all, some people might say, hey, well, you guys have this endowment, but I think everyone, a lot of people know that those endowments are tied up in funds uh, and they can't, all those dollars can't be accessed. So it, it really could um, could impact, you know, institution, private institutions as well. Yep. And then, the, you know, what do we do for our state colleges? How do we keep that things going? Um, so I'm just trying to go through Ginny's list and trying to see how best uh, to handle it. So I'll just keep, keep going through um, and then people can just jump in. You know, we asked about healthcare. And so uh, um, 
You know, she says, yeah, for the most part, hospitals and providers need to have a return to elective procedures, have options for telemedicine to increase financial stability, um, building global budgets with balanced per, uh, prospective payments for hospitals and independent providers is important. Continuing systems linking with community services is important to financial survival. All of the workers in the organizations listed below and others will require a, a vacation from stress. Uh, and support services that revive us all, creative programs that lift lift people from daily apprehension to where they feel better have have begun to spring up. There should be identified in packages. You know, she brings up some really interesting good points there that I haven't thought about. Uh, you know, all these folks that have been in the hospital on the front lines, um, healthcare, we should probably have them consider and look at issues around how do you give people breaks? How do you give them, make sure that's on people's radar? You know, the other thing that Ginny puts in hers, which I know we've all been talking about, is, you know, testing and contact tracing. And when we were on with Dr. Levine, I know several of us asked the question, how do we, you know, you know, is it right to test everyone? And his concern was that the test is just not good enough. It doesn't make sense. But contact tracing does seem to be advancing in the state and are there ways I think to do more of it would be another great question. I suspect Senator Ingram, uh, health and welfare is kind of asking that question. We are, yeah. yeah. That and, and many, many of the things that <laughs> Senator Lyons has mentioned here we've been we've been looking at. Um, but yeah, definitely um, getting into the contact tracing now as well too. I mean mostly what we've heard in a lot of our testimony is is the financial instability of of the healthcare field now because um, i mean from from including the insurance companies actually the commercial insurers um because they're drawing on reserves to cover all these new things that we've asked them to cover and then you know the hospitals and the independent providers are also struggling because they can't get revenue from the um elective procedures uh, one care is trying to is you know, the capitated payments that they pay are helping a lot of these. They're providing kind of a you know foundation, the base amounts that they can count on. Um, but the whole system is is definitely unstable. Yeah. So can I just can I just yeah, add, please go ahead. I'm wondering we probably we don't have this on our list, not that I've heard, but um, what about the issue of lawsuits against the nursing homes? I mean, that's a big issue in other states. Some states have absolutely put in a prohibition against it, but that's certainly going to be an issue here, I would assume, since it's going on in other parts of the country. I think so those are lawsuits where people are suing because people have become sick or or, or died. Away. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so we should we should put that issue, I think, in judiciary as well as health and welfare. Okay. People agree with that. I mean, it seems like it would overlap with both, just make both committees aware of it. Okay. Um, and again, yeah, talked about some of this will just be supporting uh, Senator Plina. Well, I was just going to say, you hear on the national level that they're talking about um, protecting corporations from liability for things that went wrong. I don't know if that how that how we think about that, or also I don't know whether that would relate to nursing homes or not. And I don't think it's happened yet, but they're talking about tying future support programs to liability protection for corporations that normally would be subject to suits like this. Just something to keep in mind. I don't have a solution. That's a good question. So I, I would think that in this first paragraph, we should put on our list telemedicine, yeah. um, testing, um, all in the healthcare area. Um, and the next bullet she does overall challenges, the financial stability of the hospitals, primary care docs, um, um, home health agencies, basically each in their own individual area. That all ought to go in the healthcare area, but ought to be listed all as different issues. And the next step will be for us, who's making sure that steps are being taken to deal with those issues. We've, we've done initially, um, we sent money out the door to hospitals and the hospitals have got some payments from the feds. We've sent some payments out to primary care docs, but we're, it's, it's, it's a big 
group of things. And in the back of that, we have been taking testimony on telemedicine, but I think we've made some strides in telemedicine that we aren't going to want to go back on. Wouldn't you agree with that, Debbie? I would completely, yes. So, I, but I think if we're going to create a complete list of what's going on, those things have to be on the list for this health and welfare group to look at, but broken out in their individual areas. And I think testing over the next year is going to be crucial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and keeping up with, you know, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, so all of that with health and welfare. Uh, Senator Campion. Yeah, please. Sorry, I just wanted to weigh in. Um, I think the way that Senator Lyons did this, you're right. It's like she was writing an exam question or something. So it's interesting to see her response. And um, um, one of the things that she doesn't say explicitly, but she maybe she does later on in her list, but is is uh, mental health and trauma related to the COVID crisis. And I think she gets at it a little bit with when she's saying that, um, you know, people are going to need a break from the traumatic work that they've done. Yes. I mean, in other states, there have been instances of healthcare workers committing suicide after ha having to deal with so much misery and trauma and emergency and just making sure that our healthcare workers and people on the front lines in particular, but just our entire society um, has robust access to mental health services and trauma. And this is an issue for school districts too. That and is such a great and point. colleges Absolutely. and universities, just making sure we have those support systems for everybody who's gone through this bad situation. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, going to pop up a little bit in our, you know, circle down here where, you know, some people are really starting to struggle and it's uh, how do we make sure that they get the help they need? And, and I think you bring up a great point with the schools, you know, I have an aunt in the kingdom who's a counselor and I haven't talked to her, but I, a lot of the counseling that she's doing at schools, it's all this kind of thing. And I, I don't know how effective it is. And if there's anything we can start to do to, to help those folks, to help those children that are at home and they would usually meet with, you know, you know uh, in person. Um, so it's a great point. But I, I would, I would think that somehow we need to add mental health in the immediate service for the trauma um, that people have. Um, how are we dealing with that and, and who's stepping up in, um, and making sure that in this immediate time that, that the things that relate to the trauma of it are there? Does that answer, does that say what you wanted to say, Ruth? Yeah, it's just across the board, making sure there's trauma-related um, services available um, in the immediate term, and then obviously longer term, and that's obviously long term. But but there's going to be some immediate. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Senator Plina, did I see your hand up? Yeah, I was just going to actually. It becomes repetitive, but I was talking to someone who does counseling with young children, and they she said that there's a lot of young kids who are really turned off by the Zoom meetings with their teachers. Like they don't understand how it works. Like why isn't she looking at me? Why isn't she talking to me? How can I engage with this thing? So this idea of having kids do Zoom meetings with schools is not necessarily working out for any for a lot of people, and it's causing a certain kind of trauma where like. I know of one five-year-old who won't go on Zoom meetings with the school anymore because he just doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't feel right. He doesn't get it. He doesn't yeah. feel connected. So anyway, it's just something that everybody's repeating, but it's, it's worth keeping in mind that what we're doing is not necessarily working for everybody. Yeah. There's a trauma. And I would just add too that um, with the mental health aspect is also um, substance misuse because that, you know, that's the way that people, when they're stressed, sometimes will try to self-medicate or, you know, and, uh, and, you know, we've seen that like alcohol sales have gone, have gone right. way in Vermont. And so we're, I think we're going to have to deal with, with that to people trying to handle things on their own in, in a way that's not necessarily very healthy. Yeah. Our alcohol sales are up 14%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. Thank you. Uh, so where did we leave off there? Um, transition these deadlines. Uh, 
so it looks like she covers some things with education. We've talked about governance, uh, I think what she mentions below, transitioning to new deadlines for flexibility and fixed deadlines based on public health. I, I think uh, set the ground rules for towns establishing. Um, I think um, 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 one of the things she brings up here is um, is the housing in the GA. We've got two thousand people in um, in um, um, basically motels now, right? And nearly three hundred of those are kids. Um, who's taking on that issue and um, and looking at it? And we should. Um, that's probably healthcare, health. Um, or human services for us um, to list as an issue for um, our group to um, take a look at. Right, Rich? You can uh, yes. The 2000 in motels, how is that different from a year ago? Um, it's way more, Mark. It's, uh, and, I, and I haven't got the exact number, but one of the things that they've done, which is different than not, is We've rounded people up and put them in motels. Yeah, you know? I, I, and I just I was just wondering what, how much was, where the where the people have come from that are in the hotels that weren't in the hotels last year. What the numbers were. So yeah, we uh, we we picked them up off the street and we brought them in because we didn't want them transmitting. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So we've never had so many in motels. Okay. And I, I think the last I heard, it was like 286 of them were, were kids. I think that's, that, that may not be the exact number, but that's in the range, I think. So it's approaching 300 that are kids. Okay. I think, we, and I think we've all thought that the child care center stuff belongs in education. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was gonna ask you that. Um, well, I'm happy to work on that issue. <laughs> Great. Um, so then we move on to health care. Uh, you know, we know that, uh, didn't you mention finances? We know that's an, an issue. She's also mentioned the global budget piece. Um, yep, all right, so we sort of went through that. Um, uh, maintain public health prevention transition policies. That certainly belongs in uh, health and welfare. Base transition decisions on public health first. Yes, of course. Uh, do not allow Airbnb until Vermont vaccine is available and used as above. Uh, establish lodging public health guidelines for camps, long-term stays, such as Basin Harbor, Tyler Place. Allow guests to stay but not roam. So those policies I think all belong in in health and welfare uh, some of them I know things have come to finance uh, related to some of these things but it's all been from health and welfare so uh, well can I just weigh in on the yes, vaccine please. I mean the, are we going to try and coordinate some of this with the governor who has said you can take reservations for places starting June 15th you have to advise them you know they have to do all the protocols that are required and that um, you might shape in the state, you may have to tell them to come, but people can start taking reservations after June 15th. That's kind of what's the standard out there right now from the governor. Right. So it's certainly Airbnbs are gonna be being used before there's a vaccine in place. Right. So and there's a whole protocol by Airbnb out there on its own it, when they do open as to what somebody who is renting has to do. Yeah. So it's like. So yeah, I know you bring up a good point. A lot of different groups, including the industry itself, is going to be putting yeah. its own guidelines up, and the governor is going to be making decisions, and we're going to try to weigh in. I right. think for now, just as we go through this, you know, it's a good thing just to on the health and welfare. Uh, piece it might also belong I mean that's really where the decision is going to be made so we can put it there and and what we're going to do Alice after we uh sort of chart these out each of the subcommittees will go through and start to pull things out clean the list up touch base with folks and then I think we'll get a more 
whittled down uh, list of priorities. Good. Yeah, because there's just so much. Um, anything else that jumps out to anybody on Senator Lyons' uh, list? Just going through it. Um, Can I just say in, um, because we touched on a number of different areas, including nursing homes and including um, that, um, I've heard of a number of adult days that are in financial trouble and on that. I've heard um, um, we've got some EMS squads and rescue squads in it. I'm not sure there's anybody in one place that is collecting all the information about the places about to go out of business. If I have adult days and I have EMS and I have all of these things that um, are showing signs of weakness and there's stuff going out, or if when we ended this childcare, there's um, facilities that do end up going out regardless of all the efforts that we put in. Are we collecting that information any one place? So may I ask, so do you mean as people are starting to struggle, are they reaching out to folks like ACCD or somewhere else? Well, Is that you're asking? Uh, no, it, no, uh, it isn't just, are, are they reaching out? But do we know where we're losing um, uh, losing these facilities? If 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 do are we creating a picture? I I and maybe Senator Polina knows better than I. I heard the adult day and Barry is talking about not reopening its doors. Are we creating a picture of where those the holes that are going to be created of this are for those type services? The adult day in Barry has definitely said that they don't plan to reopen. So that's really a big shock to the community, Project Independence. The other thing I was going to mention was that government operations has been taking a lot of testimony and having a lot of conversations about EMS and the ambulance services. And so we're not exactly keeping uh, all the data, but we've had a lot of conversations with them. We've got a few legislative proposals. So that's just one area of the healthcare system, which for some reason has come under GovOps. And, but we've spent uh, really a lot of time talking with them and I have a pretty good understanding of what the challenges they face are. And, and a lot of them are in big trouble, which is something we could talk more about later. But I just wanted you to know that in terms of EMS, we're definitely on top of that as much as we can be. But, you know, right. But, I, and that, that, but who is someplace in state government keeping track of all of those things that are in danger so we, in the transition time, know when we come out of where the holes are going to be. Nobody. So some kind of mapping, right? You know, uh, where things, where we might need to, areas, geographic areas that might need assistance, whether it's adult day, early childhood daycare, that kind of thing, correct? Yeah, I think somebody needs to be tracking that. Yeah. Well, I would think, I mean, Richie, wouldn't it be the relevant state agency? So CDD should be tracking, you know, how many child care centers are potentially going out of business and um, whatever. I don't remember the acronym for the age, Office of Aging would track the adult days or whatever. I, I feel like you're absolutely right. We need to make sure that this is being tracked and taken care of and data is being collected. I don't know that we have the capacity as this committee to do that. I think we, that we're going to need it. I would, would think we have the, um, the wherewithal to suggest, and we do quite frequently to um, the administration, that maybe within the Secretary of Administration, all that information gets fed back to them so we know yeah, where the hot spots are that really yes. need immediate assistance. Yeah. So, so does it make sense to put on in each of the committees that issue that, you know, we, the importance of reaching out to government agencies uh, and, and do some kind of mapping? Want to do a panel like that? Yeah. Yeah. I, did you have a comment, Mark? I'm. 
we're we have a shortfall of money. We have people unemployed, and we have businesses that are not going to reopen. Yeah. Um, and having a map of the businesses that are not going to reopen is we can make a long list. Um, what one of the things that would be a priority was to see which where can federal money be spent to resolve some of these problems? Yeah, good point. And where can it not be spent? Um, we keep, I'm watching us talk about making a list and mapping um, the bad news, but everything you read and every experience in every other country where they've had problems like this, the, the mapping that is most expensive is the tracing, test and trace, test and trace. Um, we've got like a jailbreak here and we've got, we're running through the, the bushes trying to catch, catch, catch people. Um, it, if we don't test and we don't follow up on who's sick, all the rest of this stuff is just gonna continue to get worse unless the enemy, the virus just dries up and goes away. <laughs> but we're spending our, this. we're transitioning to what in this committee? I, I'm, I know I'm not asking, I'm not being positive thinking here, but what is it the committee is designed to do to weed out the things that we ought to be doing now as we transition to deal with this in the long haul? Or do we look at Oh, well, everybody's opening up, so things will be back to normal soon. Um, I, I think, I, 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 I think what you're, I think what you're saying, Mark, is in the transition. One of the issues we have to have on the list is, what about testing? Because we're going to have flare-ups like um, the girls' school, and and we're going to have to maintain a level of testing that we never have before. Well, we we haven't, and and. The, uh, the second part of testing, if you look at what China and South Korea and Singapore and those places have done, when someone is sick, they have a, a meeting and they chase down all the people that were in contact previously. Um, that is a relentless and technical job, but that's what goes after the, the problem. If we're going to simply spend our time on how do we help people who are victims of the problem and then find a way to the resources to pay for that at the same time that people are out of work. Um, that's not a formula for, that's, that doesn't strike to me as being a formula for, I don't know what it's a formula for. I, I think what you're saying is that issue that you just brought up needs to be on our list because over the next year, we need to do can more te we need to maintain a high level of testing and we need to be better about tracking people if we're going to stay on this yeah stay on this we haven't we barely gotten on it because we've all been told to stay at home and we've slowed it down but we can't live that way right forever um People have to go to work and they have to go to work in an, in an environment where if someone is sick um, and catches it, there's a, there's a posse that goes after the people who have been in contact. Um, yep. So I, 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 I'm, I, I'm not being helpful here with finding answers, but I'm, but I don't, I'm trying to, I don't know how we can make a list of everything that isn't going to get done. So Sorry. No, nope, that's that's fine. Ruth? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, I agree with you, Mark, definitely. And I think that a lot of that is starting to happen more and more and has been happening. And we heard that in testimony from, excuse me, the Commissioner of Health about a week and a half ago. And their sort of plan to um, increase testing and contact tracing. And they, I think in their budget request is a request for additional staff members to do the contact tracing. Um, 
Rich and Debbie, you might know more um, on health and welfare health care committee, but um, that's my impression is that that is already in the works to be ramped up and we should keep it in on our list for sure. And I think there are already plans to, to do that. Maybe they're not sufficient, but there's certainly not not happening. We need to, but we need to make sure that that's on our list to make sure that we're pushing that um, those things along. Yeah, I think we'd all agree that the overarching issues are what uh, we keep saying: testing, contact tracing, uh, continue. You know, if things are going to open up, how do you do it in a in a safe way? Whether it's you know asking the questions that health and welfare are asking around. What are the requirements for inns, healthcare workers, just going to the grocery store, uh, mandatory this, mandatory that? All of those are, are big overarching questions. Um, given the time, should we move on to appropriations? Yep. Okay, great. So uh, Jane has um, gone through, uh, first thing, she believes, of course, should be in economics is, you know, taking a look at our current resources, how they're being allocated, uh, our existing programs designed and administered in a way that targets the right beneficiaries, or are they largely giveaways to a small set of businesses? Um, how effective are current tax policies, programs, and strate strategies to support businesses, those kinds of things? Uh, do they recognize where job creation occurs? All of this, I think, can be divided up into economic development. And that subcommittee, when you look at that, you may, you're going to probably be in contact with uh, not only economic development, but some health and welfare stuff might be in there, as well as um, finance. But I think all of those questions belong in, in economic development at this point. Uh, education. Let's see if there's anything new here. How will the educational needs for students who have essentially lost a year of education be addressed? Are there compensatory programs? Uh, that's something that I think, Ruth, you guys are already starting to ask what it's going to be look like when things kind of transition back. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, all that should go into education. How can VSC, uh, Vermont State Colleges, play a vital and creative force in meeting workforce needs, build its enrollment by offering courses where there's strong demand. Uh, how can VSC replace Southern New Hampshire's inroads into our high schools? I think they belong and in, in certainly uh, you might divide some of those questions up not only in, into education, but I think economic development could have weigh in on some of those. Uh, okay, we'll go on to government. Local government be required to build financial res reserves so they have some fiscal cushion in times of economic downturn. I think that's a great question that, uh, again, we'll put it into economic development, but that's something that I think would overlap with a lot of committees. How to be realistic in what state government can do and should do for the near future? How can government best invest the CRF money for long-term benefits, uh, broadband housing, other infrastructure? Um, so... So I would, I would think that this should be in, in government, but the other piece to this that I would, we've started to give our local governments the ability to put off um, dates for collection of um, taxes. At the local level, we've done that. I know they're struggling with that in finance. Um, you know, are we going to end up in a place in the short term where um, local communities need a place to do short-term borrowing to help them through stuff because they've run up against a wall that people really can't pay. And should we look at that in conjunction with long, more longer term, um, the idea of having communities um, um, build reserves? Because I see the reserves piece as more of a long-term piece. Should we? That's the piece that Beth Pierce started working on and has that propose, proposal that's house with regard to paying the interest and other charges with regard to loans that municipalities might get through FEMA care. So there's already something 
started on that and it would certainly be good to keep track of it. Yep. Okay. I was just saying GovOps, we've been talking about that as well. The idea that local communities are gonna be hard pressed because they're not gonna be able to collect the taxes that are due necessarily, whether it's before the deadline or after the deadline, regardless of what the deadline is. People are gonna have trouble paying their taxes which then leaves the town short, which then means the town can't give money to the education fund on time. So that's something finance is thinking about. But bottom line is, yes, it's definitely an issue that has to be explored and GovOps will be thinking about that. Right. So I, I think we ought to list that under government, uh, uh, the government piece. Yeah. Yes. I'm gonna go off for a second because I'm running out of battery. I have to move into another room where I can sure, plug okay. in my, my iPad. I'll be back. Uh, and then healthcare, um, how do we use it, this experience to accelerate payment reform so that system is less uh, reliant on the more volatile fee for service? Is our public health system as robust as it needs to be? How well it is, uh, how well it is respond to the pandemic? So yeah, that can go in healthcare. Um, Ruth, do you wanna just take us through quickly agriculture? Yeah, sure. Since you uh, did all this work, and we're going to try to still stick to our one o'clock. So, um, yeah, if you could divide it up a little bit, that'd be great for us. Yeah, the Ag Committee is working on a, an Ag Relief um, package, and it would include um, assistance to dairy farmers who've seen a huge drop in uh, milk prices. It would include assistance to um, other kinds of non-dairy farmers for expenses they've had to incur in order to react to the coronavirus, um, particularly things like pivoting their business to do more online or farm stands or um, more direct to consumer stuff. Um, and then um, there's a piece about migrant farm workers. Um, the, they did not qualify for the federal funding um, that the $1,200. So we have a piece in there for them. And I'd like to come back to that and ask your, um, ask you about that. And then um, some other sort of uh, systemic um, issues with um, our ag and food systems. We're looking at those. So those are the sort of short term things. And then we have some longer term, which were meant for the other committee. Um, uh, but the two things that I think that I think the Ag Committee has got most of these covered, but the two things that I, I would like to put on the list for this, this committee are one, food security just in general, um, or food insecurity just in general. We have some, we might include in our Ag package things like funding for the Vermonters Feeding Vermonters program, which is through the food bank or school lunch programs or um, the, the EBT um, SNAP program, but those are issues that are, are both agriculture related, obviously, but also just health and human services related. So I think that they should go on this list too, food insecurity um, for, I guess, Debbie and Brian being on that would you, area. Would you put the food insecurity stuff with more or less human services and healthcare well, and would you put the loan stuff more with um, with economic development for our purposes? Yeah, I think the food insecurity stuff is home is the health and welfare, and then the, the what do you mean the loan stuff? The the to farm. Um, yeah, you you I were think, talking about the relief stuff. Right. Um, so I guess the ag relief stuff, sort of generally speaking, would be economic development. Um, but I also just, you know, the Ag Committee is working on that. So um, you can have it on, we can have it on our list here, but we're hoping to have a package within the next week or something. But the one thing I, I would, I, you know, and Anthony can weigh in here too. We've had some discussions about this. Um, what we have in our bill currently is a more uh, narrow um, farm worker related um, uh, relief for for migrant farm workers who work on our dairy farms who are not U.S. citizens. They didn't qualify for the federal money. And so we have right now a $500 um, payment. It would probably have to come out of general funds, not out of federal funds because of concerns about federal clawback for providing relief to non-citizens. 
and you know we're getting a lot of testimony that this should be broadened and broadened out to more than than just farm workers to other people who may not have qualified or did not qualify for the federal funding and i have made the argument in ag that we should be sticking to farm workers because it's an ag relief bill um, and that there may be other opportunities to talk about this in other committees so i just wanted to put it on the agenda I don't know which list it would go on, but um, the possibility of some relief to Vermonters, people who live and work in Vermont, but who are not American citizens and therefore didn't qualify for the federal relief, stimulus relief checks. Um, maybe put on I, economic development for now. Yeah, maybe yeah. economic development. Um, just something I, I think it would be worth talking about broader than just um, agriculture. But yeah, that's a great point. Thanks. Great. Okay. Uh, let's go through Michael's. It looks like Michael, if I, I just read Michael's housing and urban develop, uh, housing economic development. A lot of what he's talking about are small businesses. How do we, how do we focus on them? Uh, certainly these are all things that I'm sure are already on Michael's list, but we just, you know, we can list them on ours uh, under economic development. And I know we're all hearing from, from, and I'm glad he put it down, restaurants and the tourism industry clearly hurting. Uh, what sorts of things can we do for, for those guys? Um, and that's really what Michael's emphasized. And I think we can- uh, That's all economic development. All economic think, development. All yeah. of this. It's, it's, not, it's not, it's not, the, I'm sorry. It's not development. It's, it's a, a notion of restoration. Yes. Uh, yeah, you're, and, you're correct. And that, and that's the, that's the area that, that we have a huge number of people in and the prospects are without testing and tracing, the prospects are, um, you know, what's gonna happen when the, the meat plants run out of the meat they've already packed and the frozen, the frozen food and the, what's gonna happen when the half of our agricultural processing industry in the United States which is geared exclusively to restaurants and the hospitality industry. I mean, half the food is prepared for them and it's packaged and sent and marketed differently than the half that goes to grocery stores. Um, is that gonna suddenly bounce back or do we need to transition to a more local um, solution if grocery stores begin to run out of things that have been you know, stored and back ordered. Is that our responsibility or do we just assume that everything, that we're transitioning back to normal? I think that's a good thing to put on economic development as well. The contact tracing and, and health uh, aspects of reopening, we've already covered in our on health and welfare. And I think, again, that's an overarching, probably perhaps one of the most important things we can deal with is you know, doing testing, doing contact tracing, how do we give people this, uh, the necessary information to return when they need to return, the necessary requirements to, to have a healthy day at work, et cetera. Uh, Joe Benning Institutions. Um, so, I You know, Joe mentions, I think, overall, his concerns that are happening around, you know, what he's experiencing, what his community is experiencing around economics, around education, um, that kind of thing. I don't see uh, anything new. He mentions judiciary reopening that we've covered, uh, mentions local municipality, uh, he apologizes for being negative. I don't think it's being negative. I think he's just kind of talking about what his, what he's witnessing. Um, and again, he highlights, understandably, you know, the Vermont State Colleges. So I think, I think his comments are pretty well already in incorporated. Uh, Senator Baruth, um, you're on this committee as well, Senator Hardy and Senator McNeil. Um, all of this. I'm sorry, Senator Ingram. Yes, of course. You're the vice chair. Excuse me. 
Indeed I am. I, I do apologize. Uh, <laughs> it looks okay. like uh, um, all of this, again, since we're right now we're just dividing things up and uh, all of this can go into the education pile. I don't see anything that belongs anywhere else. So I think all of these kinds of things are going to fall into uh, issues that education um, are, you know, what all of you are looking at. And then I think with that, we have divided things up, save for Senator uh, Bray's list. If we could just open it, I sent it to you all just before things got started. Um, and let's just take a quick look at this. Uh, you know, uh, understandably, a, a lot of concerns around clean water. Um, you know, we could put those certainly, you know, in health and welfare's uh, uh, responsibility right now. And then, you know, we can, we'll have to divide those up. But that's where a lot of what Senator Bray is talking about seems most appropriate. Um, certainly outdoor recreation and planning uh, could also go into, um, I think, into uh, economic development, looking at issues related to tourism, things like that. I think right now I, I'm feeling. Hey, Bri Brian, in. yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, but I I have uh, I have to leave right now. Yeah, you go ahead. We'll finish up in the next few Thank minutes. Yeah. So we've taken a first stab at this. Alleged council will produce <laughs> uh, for all of us a list of how uh, we've divided up the priorities and what we Richie and I thought we would do is just when we all get the list. Each subcommittee could have a, a more careful look at the list, um, see where there might be holes that you would identify. So uh, Debbie and I, we're gonna look at health and welfare. We'll look at, uh, we'll meet in the next day or so once we get the list back and identify holes, look at things that might be priorities, look at things that we might wanna communicate right away to committee chairs, um, but initially look at each list as all right this is where what we have where are some of the holes what sorts of things rise to the top uh in terms of your prior what you think are priorities and we thought we would you know again regroup in about a day yes uh luke so uh a question and then a, a warning to everyone question do you prefer the list as a word doc as a chart or as a spreadsheet? I don't know what is easier for you to read off your various devices. I can only speak for myself, but I love Word documents myself. I have a feeling, knowing my colleagues and friends, Senator Hardy strikes me as an Excel spreadsheet person. Um, <laughs> and, but, and I'm, but whatever I get, I'm gonna be fine with, so. Uh, oh, okay. I yeah. like word. We can do both. Just okay, that'd be great. Uh, either, either one's fine. Yeah. All right. so, I can do either uh, one, Luke. <laughs> thank you. And then a warning. What I was working on is a word doc and making changes as you folks discussed. Um, but what I'd started with earlier today is simply cutting and pasting the emails. So I will send that to you. Is still very long. I don't want to take something out because it might be something that's relevant to you. Some of it seems duplicative. Some of it seems uh, very lengthy. If you individually or the two of you in each subject area can just let me know what to take out or condense, it can be easily done. I just don't want to do that without your input. So that's the warning. It's long. Read it through. I think half of it probably could be stricken. I just don't want to do that until you folks have seen uh, what your colleagues submitted to you and make a decision that indeed it can be taken out. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. That's good. So again, we'll look when, and you can get that to us later today. I can send it to you uh, right now. Let me look at all and take out some of the obvious typos and such. 
Okay. I can get it to you soon. That'd be great. And then we can all spend, I'll touch base with Richie to see when he wants to meet next. But if the subcommittees could just start to look at the list, look at what might be missing, what some of the holes are, uh, some of the concerns, and then some of the things that rise to the top. And I think that will lead to an interesting discussion uh, when we meet again. In the meantime, we'll start sharing these things with Senator Ash and get a sense from him uh, some some more direction. Okay. We know when we're meeting again in a big group. I think um, I think we talked about Wednesday. So uh, and I do apologize. We did say that we were going to put together a calendar. So um, let me just check with Richie um, and work to put that calendar together. But let's try. Let's just tentatively say Wednesday at about the same time. Noon. Yeah, does that work for everybody? I know there's some folks that have uh, earlier morning commitments that day. So we'll just say tentatively Wednesday at noon and then Richie and I will get back to you. Ruth, did you have another question? Judiciary usually goes until 12.15, but days. All right, I'll note that. So maybe we do 12.15 on Wednesday. Okay. Sounds yeah, good. I had a question about, and maybe Alice is the only one who would know this, because um, she's on appropriations. It seems like a lot of what our our solution, unfortunately, may be is that this thing needs money. This problem needs money. <laughs> and I'm wondering, um, Alice, if appropriations is, do you have a big spreadsheet of, no. of how you're divvying up or starting to think about divvying up that CARES money or not? No. No, not yet. That's the, we, we can't print it. So we better use the stuff that's sent our way that all Americans apparently have to pay back. I don't see the corporations paying anything back. It's always measured right. on per person basis. Um, that's where the money is. Uh, Vermont has traditionally in the last 30 years, whenever we've come to a crunch time, we've cut spending. Um, that's what we do. And I, I don't know if if we follow the same pattern um, and reduce taxes and cut spending and how that, what that transitions to um, other than people being further and further divided on the uh, income scale. I think one, what Ruth brings up is a really good point. And maybe what we can do is on Wednesday, we could get uh, Senator Kitchell in for 15 minutes and just, Give us some guidance around what kinds of things, um, you know, what some of the limitations are, what the, you know, just a picture of the reality out there as we move through these this list. Um, and I think that would be would be helpful. Yeah, that because I think that we're all going to have needs, and I, I mean, just thinking yeah. about education, the Vermont State Colleges, that's a huge check that we're going to yeah. need to write if we're going to have them open. So I don't even know like what the markers are, and it'd be really helpful for us to hear that. I'd say the Vermont Great State point. Colleges are not going to be funded by CARES, not by the regular CARES for COVID. I mean, there are other other money maybe, but it's hard to know at this point. Yeah. yeah. Well, getting a better sense of those plans would be helpful. Yeah, I think it's because yeah, a lot of the health care provisions are, are in other bills too, not necessarily the cares. So I'll invite we'll invite Senator Kitchell in. And if anybody else decides uh, that they want to hear from somebody else, uh, in addition to going over some of the holes and some of the priorities that we see, just let us know. And I think that's a good point, Ruth. Let's hear directly from the chair of approps right now and and see what we, we're actually dealing with and help guide some of this rather than talk about it and then none of it can really end up happening. Great, thanks everybody. We'll be in touch. Um, really you. appreciate seeing all of you. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you, bye. Bye. -bye. bye.